So uh, let's go ahead and get the afternoon program started. Um, we'll try and keep on schedule. Uh, two more speakers, and then we'll break for um, our patient uh, presentation after that. So to kick off the afternoon section, uh, Dr. George Shade is a uh, faculty member in our Department of Urology, uh, urology surgeon. And he's uh, giving a talk, Histotripsy, a novel ultrasound-based treatment for kidney cancer. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, I get to start off, so hopefully nobody falls asleep from uh, eating lunch. Um, and so I'll try to keep it interesting. Um, and so just to kind of... I wasn't quite sure what to cover. This is my first time at this event. Um, and I do a lot of work with members of the Applied Physics Lab um, working on this technology called Histotripsy, which I'll talk about. Um, and so I thought, as kind of a lead-in, I would talk a little bit about, just very briefly, on image-guided therapy, which I didn't see on the program, because uh, that's sort of, in a sense, what I'm, I'm trying to accomplish. And then we'll introduce everyone to Histotripsy and then kind of talk about some of the stuff we've done and, um, and ultimately what we hope to achieve. Um, and so I'll kind of quickly glance over this. You guys all saw some of these numbers earlier uh, today in Dr. Ticotti's first few slides. Um, and as, as, as we've touched on kind of extensively, that for for patients who have smaller renal masses, um, particularly those that are less than four centimeters, um, partial nephrectomy is the gold standard, and um, it's very efficacious for, for the majority of patients with, with uh, stage 1A disease, so those less than four centimeter tumors. Um, but obviously, it's still invasive, and in whether that's a robotic or laparoscopic procedure. Um, and, and so, you know, there's been a long interest in, in quote-unquote image-guided therapy, um, and, and kidney cancer is really one of the ideal tumors for that in that, uh, unlike, for example, the prostate, um, we, we see tumors very easily on pretty much all standard imaging modalities. And so um, you kind of see the, the full gamut there, ranging from ultrasound, CT, um, and MRI. Um, and so because of this, um, people have looked at it. And obviously, if you're going to try to invent something new or, or less invasive, you, know, you obviously want to make it as good or hopefully even better than traditional therapies, in this case, partial nephrectomy. Um, while reducing the morbidity um, by preventing collateral damage. Um, and in, in the current state, uh, at least in the U.S., the, the, the kind of the mainstay of, of, of focal therapies are cryotherapy, so freezing the tumor, um, or radiofrequency ablation, which essentially um, emits radio waves to, to cook tissue. Um, and without question, at this point, cryotherapy is thought to be the preferred modality. Um, and there's other techniques being evaluated, including microwave therapy, um, essentially putting little electrodes onto emit microwaves, uh, something called electroporation, which is actually a non-thermal technique where you essentially put two electrodes in a tumor and pass um, current through it to try to make holes in the cells and kill them that way. And then something called HIFU, which is high-intensity focused ultrasound. And that's somewhat related to, to what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and in kind of the current iteration, um, it's actually uh, a laparoscopic probe um, where essentially you would put it on the tumor and then use ultrasound to heat the tissue. Um, and in all cases, um, all these techniques are still invasive. They require uh, percutaneous uh, uh, approaches, so sticking needles through the skin, or in some cases, laparoscopic. Um, and so although the goal is, is to, to be less invasive than a partial, that they're still invasive. Um, and this is sort of a, a really nice cartoon I found sort of depicting what um, percutaneous cryotherapy looks like in, in the current state. And so essentially, um, patients um, under either conscious sedation, um, sometimes just with local, or in some cases general, depending on how uncomfortable it is for the patient, uh, essentially will go to a radiology room with a CT scanner and using a combination of ultrasound and CT guidance, attempt to pass um, multiple needles uh, into the kidney um, as depicted there, uh, both in the cartoon and then uh, in, in the picture. Um, and so, I mean, compared to open surgery or, or even robotic surgery, it's less invasive, but obviously, you end up with a bunch of holes in your back and it's still uncomfortable uh, and in some cases requires general anesthesia. Um, <clears throat> and historically, for sure, um, these, these approaches, whether cryo or RFA, um, while relatively effective, aren't nearly as effective as, as partial nephrectomy, which is the gold standard. And so um, this table is from the AUA guidelines that are now about, I think, five or six years old. Um, and, and you can see that um, with cryotherapy and RFA, roughly the, 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 the five-year survival, uh, recurrence-free survival rate um, is about 90% compared to about 98% for partial and, 
LPN is laparoscopic partial and O is an open partial nephrectomy. Um, however, more recent studies have suggested that um, as our experience has, has improved and the technology has improved, that this gap is, is narrowing um, and in some cases may even be very similar, at least at three years. Um, however, um, when looking at severe complications, um, the rates are actually very similar to partial nephrectomy. And so, um, at least with these technologies, we're sort of failing to achieve what the ultimate goal is to be as effective or more effective in, in a way that results in less complications. Um, and, and some of the, the shortfalls that contribute, obviously, one, we're, we're poking things into the kidneys, so that contributes to some of the complications, such as bleeding. Um, but one of the major limitations is, is size. Um, and so with the exception of the electroporation I mentioned, um, all of these rely on thermal diffusion. And so in the case of cryotherapy, you stick probes in and you're trying to freeze something and you create an ice ball that expands. Um, in RFA, you're sort of doing the opposite. You poke something and you're having heat expand out to cook the tissue that way. And so that heat can only spread so far from your probe. And so for, for tumors greater than four centimeters in particular, um, it's just hard to reliably get that ice ball or heat to, or char, I guess, to, to spread consistently uh, throughout the tumor. And that's what I was trying to show kind of in those little cartoons between you know, a small tumor, it's, you can imagine it's pretty easy to uniformly kill maybe a one and a half centimeter tumor, but if you have a four or five centimeter tumor, that becomes difficult. Um, and then the other aspect is where the tumor is located. Um, and so centrally located tumors are more difficult to treat, uh, and I'll kind of go over this in the next slide, and are uh, associated with increased recurrence rates uh, and complications. And so um, the reason for that is if you kind of look at the kidney here, there's just a lot going on in the kidney. Um, and so the cartoon on the left is trying to depict that. You see the cortex and medulla, which are sort of the meat, the, the filter aspect of the kidney, and then the collecting system is where the urine collects, uh, as well as obviously the blood vessels that bring blood in via the arteries and the veins that take it out. Um, and Th those latter things, that's really kind of the, the business part of the kidney, and that's where the, you know, the, the main set of complications or the dreaded complications can occur. And that's also what contributes to the difficulties of effectively treating centrally located tumors. And so if you kind of imagine this lower pole tumor here, it's well away from the big blood vessels, it's way, well away from the collecting system. And so you can imagine you could probably freeze or cook this tumor without having to worry about damaging where the urine collects. Um, and um, there's this idea of heat sinking, and so blood, if you're freezing something, brings warm blood in, and so you're sort of melting your ice ball as it tries to form. In the case of cooking something, it's cooler than your, your temperature you're trying to achieve, so it's sucking heat out. Um, and so if you're in the periphery where you don't have any big blood vessels, you don't have to worry about that. But when you're centrally located, you have big blood vessels that either bring heat into your ice or suck heat out of your char. And then likewise, you have to be worried about either cooking or freezing that collecting system. And if you were to kind of cook the whole thing, and ultimately create a hole, you could end up having urine leaking out of the kidney from the damage. And so because of these, these issues, it's hard to effectively treat centrally located tumors with any of the existing technologies, which really limits um, some of the patients that we can treat with these approaches. Um, and additionally, uh, a major limitation is the ability to monitor treatment in real time. And so thermal changes historically are very difficult to monitor with sort of standard imaging uh, techniques. Um, sometimes you can see the formation of bubbles in the tissue if you're cooking it on ultrasound. In the case of cryo, you can see the ice ball forming, but you can't really see beyond the edge of the ice ball. And so it's hard to really know if you're effectively de destroying the cells or not. Um, and so that leads to sort of this question in real time, were you adequately treating the tumor? Um, and as I mentioned, it's invasive. And so this is just another picture, in this case, of laparoscopic cryo. And so um, depending where the tumors are, sometimes you just can't safely pass a needle into the tumor. And so you have to, for instance, flip the colon or the bowel out of it laparoscopically and then bring in your trocars. And this is what the ice ball looks like, if you're curious. And then this is that laparoscopic um, HIFU uh, transducer I was mentioning, which currently uh, is under a series of studies. Um, and ultimately, I'm not sure how much it brings to the table, because you still have to do laparoscopy. And, um, if you have to do that, why not just cut the tumor out, in my opinion? Um, and, and so the question is, well, can we do better? And so um, with that, that's sort of my, my segue into histotripsy. And so, well, what is histotripsy? Obviously, it has a funny name. Um, and I mentioned HIFU earlier, and, and it is a form of uh, focused ultrasound, and that's what this is um, trying to convey here, this figure. So this is an ultrasound transducer um, with sort of a bowl shape, um, and so it emits the ultrasound waves from kind of all different angles and they converge on a single point. And so that effectively increases the intensity from where at the surface is just about the same as an imaging transducer. But as all that energy converges, it increase, increases the intensity as you get closer to that focus. Um, and has anybody here had treatment for a kidney stone? And so what's, do, what, what's lithotripsy? 
Uh, so you're breaking a kidney stone. Litho is stone. Tripsy is fracturing. And so that's, that's the, how we got the name of histotripsy. And so essentially you're trying to mechanically destroy tissue. So histotripsy. Um, and so I'll kind of briefly go over HIFU, but um, in the case of histotripsy, we're trying to non-thermally and you know, mechanically destroy tissue with ultrasound. Um, and so in comparison to the thermal HIFU that I mentioned before, there's a few um, kind of key differences. And so the first is that it's much higher intensity. And so I was kind of going over this before. So for diagnostic ultrasound, the typical intensity that you would feel is roughly about one watt per centimeter squared. And so if you imagine a small little circle, you would basically pass in the equivalent of one watt of energy through that little circle. Um, with thermal HIFU, it's you know, roughly 100 fold higher. So or 100, I guess, to 1,000 fold higher. Um, and so up to 2,000 watts per centimeter squared. And histotripsy is essentially a whole nother order of magnitude higher than that. Um, and we deliver the energy in a pulsed fashion. So um, with thermal high food, normally it's a, a wave that it's just kind of on for either permanently or for like two or three seconds at a time. And so you're delivering enough energy that you start to vibrate the tissue and that leads to heating of the tissue. Um, but with our intensities, if we pulse for that long, we would heat very quickly and, and thermally destroy and probably a whole lot more. Um, um, and so by delivering short pulses of energy, we're able to induce an effect, but then have the transducer off long enough that heat doesn't build up. And so the result is a mechanical effect. And I'll kind of go over that a little bit more um, in a second. And because it's mechanical, instead of heating the tissue to coagulate it and cause necrosis that way, we're actually fractionating or pulling the tissue apart. Um, <clears throat> and so this is sort of what it looks like, um, if, you, if you really wanted to know. Um, that the key is that it's dependent on bubbles. And so that's what this is trying to, to, to convey. Um, there's a few different ways of performing histotripsy. Um, it was initially developed at Michigan about uh, 15 years ago or so, which is where I did my training as a resident, and actually came here because UW was the only other place um, doing histotripsy, uh, invented this technique called boiling histotripsy um, about four or five years later. Uh, and so the reason why it's called boiling histotripsy is just the mechanism of, of, of forming the bubble. And so essentially um, what we do is we administer high intensity pulses, like I said, um, for about, on average, about five to 10 milliseconds. Um, and that results in very rapid heating due to the, the amplitude and the kind of the, the form of the ultrasound waves we're administering. And so essentially at the focus, you create a bubble because you've boiled the tissue and you create a bubble. And then the pulses interact with that bubble and that creates forces that destroy the tissue. And so the advantage of our technique compared to the other ones is that um, the kind of the engineering and the power of your machine needed to heat something isn't as great as relying purely on sort of pressures and things of that nature to form a bubble that way. And so it's much easier to adapt existing technologies compared to some of the other mechanisms. And so we think it's a way of getting this technology into patients quicker. Um, and so just to kind of touch on, again, the, the way this works, um, our hypothesis right now is that it employs something called acoustic founding. And this is something that has been well known to the people for a long time. It's actually how humidifiers work. And so you basically pass energy into like an air fluid interface and you basically send little droplets out. In the case of humidifier, it moistens the air. Um, in the case of tissue, um, it looks something like this. Um, and so this is actually from liver, not kidney. Um, but this is the idea. And so you basically, um, at that air water or air tissue interface, you're essentially hitting it and destroying and liquefying the tissue and just forming these jets. And so those jets then in turn further destroy the tissue around it and liquefy it. Um, and like I said, this happens in the order of just a few milliseconds. And so, um, obviously, I'm talking about kidney cancer. We're, we're, we're trying to develop this technology as a non-invasive treatment for kidney cancer. And so that's one of the advantages of ultrasound. As many of you know, you've had an ultrasound. All it requires is a probe on your skin. Um, and so hopefully no pokes and, and no incisions. Um, and our hypothesis is that this will be effective where other technologies have failed because we believe it solves some of the limitations I mentioned. And so um, it's not invasive, as I mentioned. Um, and as you'll see, it offers real-time guidance on ultrasound, which is a big advantage compared to having to be in a CT machine or an MRI machine uh, to administer the treatment. Um, and it's non-thermal, as I mentioned, and so you don't have to worry about the heat sinking effects, uh, as, as I alluded to earlier. Um, and because it's mechanical, um, we think it's a lot more precise. Um, because just like you rely on that heat to diffuse, you don't have complete control of how far it diffuses. And so you're going to get a little bit of, sp of thermal spread that may uh, kill other tissue. Um, 
And so using this technology, we started off by just treating tissue like in tanks and things like that. Uh, but we've been able to use kind of transition to, to large animal models. Um, and for kidney, the, the pig is the best model um, because anatomically it's similar. It's a similar size and kind of has the same challenges as far as if you're trying to you know, kind of push ultrasound energy through an abdominal wall or, or some ribs, for instance, um, into the kidney. And so um, we, we treated uh, about 12 kidneys so far um, uh, in pigs under general anesthesia. Um, and as I mentioned, it's transcutaneous. And so essentially we get the pig ready, uh, put a water bath on the pig because you need something to transmit the sound into the tissue and then put a transducer in that water and then we can move it to wherever we're targeting. Um, and this is our current iteration of the transducer. And so you can see that actually to get all that energy, you don't need a very big transducer. Um, and so you see a Sharpie mar uh, marker for, for reference. So the current iteration of the transducer is about four inches in diameter. Um, and so overall, not very big. Um, and as I mentioned, this was all done under ultrasound guidance. Um, and so well, this is what it looks like in real time. And so the great thing about bubbles is that bubbles are air and air doesn't transmit sound. And so it, it appears as, as bright areas um, on ultrasound in real time. Um, and in the lab, we don't have as nice uh, imagers as we would have clinically. And so in, in a clinical scenario, this, this picture would be much nicer than what we can get in the lab just due to, to, to the cost of a clinical grade imager. Um, and, and so right off the bat, you can see that from this, we know exactly where we're treating in real time. And so you get that feedback of, are we hitting the tumor? And so in this case, it's just a normal kidney, which is um, kind of outlined in red just to help draw your eyes to it. Um, and the other nice thing is that the treatment produces a change in the tissue. Um, and so um, if we were to, to kind of watch the, uh, this video in real time long enough where you kind of went back and forth through the tissue, um, eventually you would see that the, the scatter that you get with ultrasound dissipates. And so you basically create a black hole in the tissue. Um, and as you'll see, there's very good correlation between that ultrasound picture and what you see when you look at the kidney right after you take it, right after the treatment. And then it also correlates very well to what you see on histology. Um, and so basically we get feedback both on the efficacy as well. And studies have shown that the, the degree of, you know, how dark this tissue is correlates very strongly with the degree of how well you liquefy the tissue. You can almost appreciate that here on this ultrasound too, and that kind of at the very edge here, you see it's a little bit darker than the main kidney. And that kind of correlates here where you sort of have only partial treatment at the edge. Um, and, and so I think that, that kind of confirms that first part that you really get a lot of feedback with this technique compared to other uh, capabilities. Um, and as I mentioned, it's very precise. Um, and so in this case, we intentionally treated two lesions right next to each other, trying to leave something like a millimeter or two millimeters of tissue. Um, and you can see that we're able to effectively leave a bridge of intact tissue. Um, and this is without any motion tracking or, or gating. And so just like in people, in pigs, kidneys move about two or three centimeters with each breath. Um, and so even without having to stop pulses for when the pig's breathing or kind of tip the transducer to follow the kidney, we were still able to, to very cleanly create two lesions right next to each other. And you can see that the, the transition from basically completely liquefied tissue, um, right? There's basically no architecture. It just looks like, you know, red jello or something. I don't know. Um, in, in the center of this lesion, um, you know, it's very clean compared to treated and normal here. Um, and we've kind of further evaluated that with electron microscopy, um, which, um, you know, is significantly higher power as far as how close you can look at the tissue. Um, and what we found is that that, that margin from normal to dead um, is 20 microns. Um, and so, you know, it's in some cases smaller than a complete cell or, you know, about the size of two red blood cells, for instance. Um, and so, and this is again, this, so those same pigs, so no respiratory gating or anything like that. Um, and so it's remarkably precise. Um, and so potentially that would help us treat close to critical structures like the collecting system um, or a blood vessel. Um, and in some ways, it may not even be necessary because another very cool thing about histotripsy, because it's mechanical, the mechanical characteristics of a tissue are very important as far as how the tissue responds. Um, and there's clearly kind of a, a very clear relationship in the, in the kidney for which tissues are most sensitive and which are more resistant. And so luckily for us, the collecting system is one of the more resistant types of tissue, uh, as is the renal capsule. And so there's sort of this little layer of collagen on the outside of the kidney and tumors, um, which is very tough. And so in theory it would help with, with bleeding because you could sort of treat the tumor and the edge of the kidney with a little bit of reckless abandon and hopefully preserve that capsule to minimize the risk of bleeding or, or something like that. Um, 
And, and further, blood vessels are even more resistant. And you'll see later, there's actually on the next slide, or two slides, um, where in some slides you can actually see a blood vessel intact surrounded by dead tissue. Um, and so potentially that would help uh, prevent bleeding. So the obvious question is, okay, great, you can break up a normal kidney, but what about cancer? Um, and so working with Dr. Wiesinski, actually, who's gonna talk next, uh, we've been able to procure pieces of human tumors um, following uh, nephrectomies. Um, and so far, we've been able to gather eight to 10 or so. It's kind of logistically challenging sometimes. It just happens often it ends up being like the end of the day and then it's hard to effectively treat. Um, but what we found is that similar to sort of the, the gradation of, of normal uh, tumor or normal tissue, um, we see similar kind of things with different types of tumors. Um, and conveniently, it looks like most tumors are actually more sensitive than normal kidney, um, which obviously is great if you're trying to spare the normal structure um, that help, hopefully would help facilitate that. And so that's what this is kind of showing here. You can kind of see um, the, the sort of that, that gradation. And this is all ex vivo tissue. And, dead tissue does, is not nearly as sensitive as living tissue. And we think that's because when something's out of the body, decomposition happens very quickly and you start to get gas in that tissue and those, that gas blocks the ultrasound energy. But you can see that um, you know, for kind of the two most common types of kidney cancer, it looks like at least ex vivo, they're about 10 times more sensitive, at least as far as complete liquef uh, liquefying of the tissue compared to a normal kidney. Um, and so obviously um, that's an encouraging thing. And so based on, on that, um, as I'll talk about, we've done some in vivo studies and I just wanted to kind of touch on the kind of things we've done to try to optimize this and how fast is it. And so what we found is that higher intensity and shorter pulses delivered at a quicker rate um, are more tissue selective and result in quicker ablation. And so to sort of explain that in maybe an easier way to understand, is that the key thing for heating is how long the transducer's on. And so normally we try to have it on less than 1% of the time. And so if we give a 10 millisecond pulse, we might only be able to fire the transducer one time per second to have a complete, you know, to have 1% of the time on. But if we shorten those pulses to one millisecond, we can deliver 10 pulses. And so in the end, the amount of time the transducer's on is the same. And so you have a, relatively speaking, the same amount of heating to the surrounding tissues. Um, and so this was what I was talking about before, where essentially you see um, three little intact blood vessels surrounded by completely destroyed tissue. Um, and in some cases, um, we've been able to tailor this further, um, where we've been able to sort of preserve the scaffolding of the normal kidney, where we, in, in some ways you could think of, you know, not necessarily for cancer patients, but perhaps there'd be a role for patients with liver failure or kidney failure or something like that. You could try to wipe out the diseased normal and figure out a way of repopulating with healthy cells. Um, and so we haven't had a chance to look into that, but it's an exciting possibility. And then getting at how fast is this? And so um, with kind of just our first goal of trying to optimize in just those 12 kidneys, um, we were able to achieve an ablation rate of about 27 cc's per hour. And just as a frame of reference, a three and a half centimeter spherical tumor is about 22 and a half centimeters. So roughly we could treat something like a four centimeter tumor in about an hour, we think. And so overall it's pretty quick. Um, and because it's non-thermal, where we want to be limited um, by size either, so potentially we'd be able to treat even larger tumors um, as long as we felt it was safe for, you know, for what's around it and things of that nature. Um, and so as I mentioned, we've, we've looked at this in, in, in vivo and kidney cancer as well. Um, and so we, we've um, been working in a small animal model, uh, which is a rat essentially that develops um, kidney cancer spontaneously. So we, it's not with the cell line. These are otherwise normal animals. They have normal immune systems and things of that nature, um, which is really advantageous for some of the other work we've been doing. Um, and essentially, just like in the pigs, we treat them uh, with their histotripsy through the skin. And so far, we've just been trying to target about half the tumor because um, you know, when you're doing this, you want to prove that you hit what you wanted to hit. Um, and so we haven't treated the whole tumors yet. And this is all done under ultrasound guidance. And we've recovered the animals up to eight weeks. Um, and in general, that's very well tolerated. Um, they don't require any pain medicine after the first day. Um, uh, and so what does it look like? Well, essentially very similar to what I showed you. Now these, those pigs were an acute study, meaning we treated and then harvested tissue pretty much right away. Um, where it's easy, they've all healed for some time. And so the borders aren't quite as distinct because it's starting to heal and contract around. Um, but you can still see that you know, this is sort of our plan treatment here. Um, and you can still see that sort of demarcation between normal viable tumor uh, and what we've liquefied. And then it starts to evolve over the course of two weeks where you can see that really contracting down, 
you're starting to see sort of a little bit of a scar forming at the periphery. Um, and we've done this in normal kidney as well, and essentially the lesions evolve very similarly and, and look, uh, end up looking very similar, which is what you see here. And so um, at eight weeks, um, essentially it looks like pretty much everything's resorbed, um, and you're left just with a very small scar um, at the center. And you can see, again, we tried to treat about 50% of this tumor, and so you can see kind of compared to its neighbor here where it's really kind of contracted down around that cavity and really shrunk in size, and it looks essentially identical to the scar you would see in the normal kidney. And, and this may be beneficial from a post-treatment standpoint. One of the problems with cryotherapy and RFA is you'll often end up with this sort of funny-looking lesion around the kidney that's very difficult to determine if there's any viable cancer in there or not um, because they often look very similar on a scan. And so the hope would be that this would look you know, either just as a little area that doesn't get any of that contrast on the scan, um, and so hopefully it'd be easier to, to follow. And this is just sort of what it looks like grossly. So again, this is the same tumor compared to untreated tumor, just docu demonstrating how things really contract around it by um, just eight weeks. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed, um, as, as well as in some other models, is that histotripsy produces a lot of inflammation afterwards. And so um, I just tried to point that out here. Basically, if you see lots of little blue dots on, on, a, on, a, on a slide, those are inflammatory cells. And so we see that at, at seven days, we see it still at eight weeks at the periphery of the scar right here. Um, and so that really got us thinking about this idea of immunomodulation, as, as you've heard um, a couple times already today. And in the HIFU world, this is probably the hottest area of research. Um, people are really looking at ways of trying to improve cancer therapies, and the immune system is an obvious target. And so th these studies are actually in the prostate cancer model, but sort of the same idea. And so this just shows that um, if you essentially either gave a mouse a tumor and then either just cut it out with surgery or you, you treated it with HIFU and then waited about two weeks and cut that tumor out, this just shows the differences uh, in the immune cells that they could harvest from the spleen. And so um, in this case, CD8 positive T cells, um, which Dr. Takodi had alluded to earlier, and these are really the sort of what we call the, the cytotoxic cells. So these are the ones that ultimately lead to cell death. Um, and so you can see there was a significant rise. And then when they looked at how these mice survived after implanting the tumor, um, what they found is that if you just gave a mouse a tumor and then cut it out, um, they died much quicker compared to if you treated a small portion of the tumor, survived the, or kind of recovered for two weeks, then cut the tumor out. And essentially, you're allowing that immune system to, to develop a response and create memory. So this idea of auto-vaccination. Um, and this is been sort of taken one step further, um, in this case in a liver uh, cancer model, um, where essentially you treat one mouse's tumor, you let things recover, and then you harvest T cells from the, the mouse, process them, and give those T cells to another animal with the same type of tumor. Essentially, trans, you know, and, and essentially you're, you're, it's what's called adoptive transfer, so you're transferring immunity. So, um, and what they've shown is that you can increase tumor regression, which you see here, um, decrease the rate of metastases, and then ultimately improve survival. And so it's obviously really exciting. It's in a, in a mouse. And people said, you know, we've cured cancer in mice hundreds of times, and it's always a lot harder in people. But um, because of that, um, yeah. you know, when, th when considered in, in the context of kidney cancer, where there's multiple well-described um, immunologic aberrations, um, and in the setting where surgery doesn't seem to really impact those aberrations, and obviously we heard about there's this well-defined role of immunotherapy, um, you know, really got us thinking about, well, what are the immunologic effects of our treatments? Um, and so we initially did this in, in, in short term, uh, and so this is just kind of very select uh, graphs. And so one of the things we looked at over the first 48 hours is can we see a signal in just the, the, the blood or the plasma? Um, and so um, and what we found was that um, there's a near significant increase in um, a molecule called HMGB1, which is sort of a molecule that's in our cells, and when you damage tissue, it's sort of leaked out of the cells and stimulates the immune system. It's sort of one of the very first events to trigger a response. Uh, and kind of downstream of that is a cytokine called TNF-alpha, which is one of the on cytokines. Um, and what we see is that there seems to be a very rapid uptick in these molecules, suggesting that there's at least that initial oomph you would need to um, cause an immune response. Um, and when we looked at the tumors at, at 48 hours with something called immunohistochemistry, so essentially you're staining the tissue with antibodies to look for specific types of cells or, or receptors, um, we saw, and I hope this conveys, um, basically the amount of brown spots in the tissue. Um, we saw more CD8 positive T cells in the treated tumor at 48 hours, so those are the, the killer T cells essentially. Um, 
compared to sham, so an, an animal that just had an ultrasound and, and not the histotripsy. But what's really interesting is that in the contralateral kidney, we saw more of those CD8 positive T cells compared to the sham treated animal. And so it's, it seems like potentially, since these animals get tumors on both sides, that you may be able to create a response that's not only targeting what you're trying to kill with your direct treatment, but we're seeing a signal on the other tumors as well. Um, and so based on that, we, we started doing some more long, uh, longer term studies. Um, we had hoped to do more IHC, but working with rats, you're really limited, and we've had a really hard time uh, with antibodies, so we um, have kind of switched to, to flow cytometry, which is kind of a fancy way of counting cells. Um, and what we noticed was that although um, long-term, when we look at the total number of all CD-positive T cells, we don't really see any differences. When we look at specific subsets, we have seen some significant differences. And so um, the first type is what's called an effector memory T cell. And so these are cells that essentially have been turned on, stimulated by their antigen, um, and essentially are out there ready to sort of turn into active cells that would then mount a, a very rapid response against you know, whatever their target is. Um, and we've seen this in, in the spleen. Um, as well as the tumor draining lymph nodes. Now, what's really interesting in the lymph nodes, and in a second I'll, I'll show you in the tumor, is that these animals seem to be immunosuppressed um, as far as the number of effector memory cells in their tumor, which is similar to human RCC. And with the treatments, we sort of return them to, to normal in some ways. Um, and um, uh, as I mentioned, we had hoped to assess the tumors with IHC. Um, and so we had to kind of change our protocol. So we didn't have enough animals to achieve statistical significance, but the trends are exact, essentially the same as what we would see in the spleen or the lymph nodes, um, suggesting that we're impacting not just the tumor, but as, as well as the other tissues as well. And then, as I mentioned, we, we saw a signal in the contralateral kidney with, with the stains, and so we looked at that as well. And so, um, whereas the left-hand curve is just the percent of the cells, these are normalized to the, to the control kidney. And what you see is that um, if you treat normal kidney, which is here, you don't really get that significant response, whether it's in you know, the, the kidney you target um, or the contralateral. Um, but when you treat tumor, not only do you get um, an effect in the kidney that you treated, which is the ipsilateral, but also that other kidney. Um, and so again, it just sort of proves that it seems like we're impacting not just the local tumor environment, but, but all around. Um, and, and so this suggests that there is this kind of cancer-specific change in the immune system, but obviously it's too early to say if this really has any impact on overall uh, tumor biology or survival. Um, and so I have my cartoon, it's, it's similar to the others, but um, I just chose this one because you can see, you know, I mentioned HMGB1, and so it just sort of points to this idea of kind of the initiating cascade and ultimately leading to uh, potentially T cell activation and, and development of memory. Um, and so in summary, um, uh, as I mentioned, bullying histotripsy offers a non-invasive uh, way to precisely ablate a tissue, which appears to be well tolerated uh, in vivo. Um, it provides real-time feedback, and so hopefully that will improve our ablation outcomes. Um, it offers selective ablation, as I mentioned, and so hopefully this will help with preventing complications and preserving normal structures. Um, and uh, it seems to, at least on kind of a first pass, uh, produce a significant immunologic changes that um, hopefully would uh, lead to improved ablation outcomes, both for patients who have just organ-confined disease. You can imagine if you're creating a strong immune response, if you miss a few cells, then hopefully the immune cell system would just kind of zap those up to, to improve your risk of recurrence. But potentially there'd be a role for metastatic patients as well. And so because we're not limited to smaller tumors, potentially instead of having a big kidney mass taken out when you have metastases, perhaps we could just blast as much of that tumor as we can. Or maybe we blast a small portion, wait a few weeks to turn on the immune system, then do surgery. Um, and so in the future, we hope to develop a clinical prototype in the next few years. Um, we just had a big grant re uh, renewed by the, uh, by the NIH, so we're hoping that by the end of that grant, we'll have a clinical prototype. Um, we obviously need to evaluate more long-term oncologic control where we try to treat a whole tumor and kind of see how that tumor responds. And then ultimately, we'd like to assess how this impacts metastases and see if combining it with you know, PD-1 inhibitor, one of the other checkpoint inhibitors would improve uh, outcomes. Uh, and obviously, science is a team effort, and so I'd just like to, to thank all my collaborators. And I'm a little bit over on time, but I'm happy to take some questions. That's the idea. That's always that's one of the questions we get because it's mechanical. Um, that 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 concern in the ultrasound community is is very low. 
people get the same questions about thermal HIFU initially because of the fact that you're hitting tissue hard enough, there, there's still a mechanical effect of thermal HIFU. Are you somehow pushing cells um, into the blood or lymphatics or something like that? Um, it's, it's a really difficult question to answer in an animal model because you know, you'd have to have hundreds and hundreds of animals to really prove for sure. And just because you proved it with a melanoma model, does that apply to kidney cancer or colon cancer or whatever? Um, but um, in kind of small studies that were done when I was a resident, to the best we can tell, it doesn't seem to improve or increase the risk of metastases uh, in a kidney cancer model. But. That, that, that's the question is we don't know. I mean, yes, because so we'd be targeting the tumor. How right. You right. So, so the thing that is right, that's in, that's in, that's in, that's like an open space, right? But in real life, if you, if I go back to that cartoon, it's actually a controlled environment, right? Because uh, in real life, it's, that's within the confines of a bubble that's within the organ, and so it sort of has a backstop. Right, so I mean, in, in real life it would, right? Because it wouldn't be like we'd, you know, again, this isn't a water bath, so there's just sort of an organ exposed, and so it's splattering just to demonstrate the point. But in real life it would be contained. Um, and you know, we, we've seen that sometimes in a little as one pulse, you can almost completely liquefy something. And so obviously there is a theoretical risk that a few cells might break off or something like that. But practically speaking with the repetitive nature, um, it's very rare that you see any intact cells with multiple pulses and, and, and within your lesion. And so. Using RF so our transducers tend to be in the like one to two megahertz range. That's that's the thinking. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, I, I kind of was really focusing on, on local disease, but, but um, absolutely, we're working on this technology in liver as well. So in those same pigs, we, we treated the livers as well. Um, at least in pigs, liver is more challenging than kidney. Um, it tends to move more than the kidney with each breath, and the, they're just, pigs are fatter there compared to over their kidneys, unlike people. Um, and so it's more difficult to get the energy there. But, um, and so we're developing this potentially for liver tumors, uh, obviously kidney. Um, and then potentially metastases. I, I just had a grant funded for prostate cancer, so we're going to start to look at that as well. Can HIFU be used on lesions that include both the meat of the kidney as well as a lesion that extends into the heart of the operating system, the collecting system? Uh, well, right, so I, I, I think so. Again, based on the sort of the selective sensitivities, we, we, our hypothesis is that we would be able to treat right up to that. and. Then, Assuming the tumors are more sensitive like we think, we could sort of tailor the therapy to give enough pulses to the tumor and hopefully minimize the risk of, of damaging the collecting system or a blood vessel that was right there. That's always the million dollar question. Yeah, I think, like I said, we're hoping to have a clinical prototype by the end of uh, this, this grant that was just funded. So that'd be about five years. And then from there, you basically have to test the device in, in animals to get FDA approval to try it in a human and then have a trial. With, with HIFU being approved, there, there is a chance that we would sort of have a workaround from, from the FDA standpoint to get into people quicker without having to do, be quite as rigorous. But sort of we're expecting to have to do it all from scratch, in which case, yeah, it'd probably be at least 10 years from actually being approved and ready for prime time. All right, thank you.